Okay, I think I'm just gonna make a start. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Anne Ma, and I'm the program director for Julie Textiles and Materials at Center St. Martins. Welcome to our design and community panel discussion. Um, we're here to share some really exciting projects from our recent graduates with you. And we're very grateful for the Color Hive um, and, and specifically Hannah Malein from um, the Mix magazine to actually support us in this event and to initiate all the exciting things to follow in a second. So um, a big thank you to Hannah. And um, I would just like to give you a short introduction of what to expect from today's event, um, because it's actually our first um, kind of online live stream YouTube event for the program. So we're very, very excited to share um, our graduate projects with you, but also to engage in a wider discussion and make this available online as a content later for people um, to kind of revisit um, where we are at the moment. So a little bit about um, our program. We are um, part of the um, St. Louis Martins College and um, part of our program are BA Jewelry Design, BA Textile Design, MA Material Futures, and from next year also part of the graduate show will be MA Biodesign. And we're all connected through um, a lot for materiality, um, intricate making and actually radical approaches to materials and, and actually the kind of belief that society and materials are very, very strong, strongly collected and shaped through materials. And that's how the um, event today came about. Um, we actually have um, worked very closely together with Rebecca Hoyes, who is an associate lecturer here at St. Rosa Martins, but she also works with the Mix um, magazine, which is a big um, trend publication. And Rebecca was, so to speak, the go-between between the industry and academia. Um, and um, together with Hannah Marlein, we um, invented um, this new format, bringing a trend publication, industry clients, and recent graduates from 2020 together in this event. Um, the students will introduce themselves and their projects to start with. So you all get a bit of an introduction of their different kind of takes on um, community. And then after that, we have prepared some questions and, and discussions, live discussions for you to kind of explore the idea of um, how design and community, um, yeah, kind of make an impact in the different kind of projects that you see. There's also the chance for everybody who's uh, watching us to type up questions in the live feed on YouTube. So please join us and ask any question you like. And we've got Sinead Butt, our external liaison co um, coordinator here with us as well, as well as the CSM events team, helping us to make all of that happen. And a big thanks to all of you as well. So I'll pass over to Hannah now. Hannah, once again, thank you so much for being such a fantastic um, partner in this crime. <laughs> and um, we would love to hear something about your background, the mix and the color hive. Brilliant, thank you very much, Anne, uh, for the introduction. Um, I just want to start by saying it's it's really great to be part of this showcase. It's been such a good opportunity to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the graduate projects this year. In fact, I think I said this earlier, it's more, probably more so than we would have done just walking around the show. So actually it's kind of made it extra, extra special. Um, so before we, we kick off today, um, I just want to go on to the next slide, um, to tell, tell you a little bit uh, more about who we are. So Colour Hive, we're a London-based creative agency. Our main focus is um, trend and colour forecasting and analysis. We work on everything from product strategy, uh, colour and material design through to content and marketing. We are the very proud creators of Mix Magazine. It's the quarterly publication uh, for professionals, which is um, now part of Colour Hive membership, where you'll find our forecast. So as part of this, we really um, explore the drivers behind our, dri um, our design stories and why we felt it important to, to look at the very kind of starting points, that inspiration that kind of eventually become the design journey with the graduates um, here today. So also taking note of those kind of much bigger picture societal shifts that influence our lives, our preferences, and ultimately how we relate to, to design. So of course, um, referencing community and communities in forecasting is absolutely nothing new, but it's something we're seeing more and more of a focus on, um, especially the last few seasons. And I just want to kind of spend a, a couple of minutes showing you um, a few of our stories for the last um, couple of seasons. So our story kinship that we forecast for um, 2020 
We looked here at evolving ways of living and working. Uh, I think we'll all admit that um, they're changing, changing family dynamics um, and taking responsibility both in the environment and our, our communities. We forecast this back in 20, 2018 and we had absolutely no idea how relevant this would be for spring summer 2020. Um, I think you may all agree. We're also seeing a huge focus on much more localized communities now a returning to use a return to using more sort of small independents so kind of your butchers and your bakers etc um which you know it, which is a great thing all kind of rocketed during uh lockdown with they were be able to be a bit more responsive with delivery boxes um in ways that the supermarkets just couldn't um and i think we're all hoping that this attitude actually continues for the sake of our high streets and, and independence um, another story we forecast actually for, for 2021, here we reference more kind of communities in factory towns, some of which we, we've already lost, some are kind of severely under threat, or actually on the more positive side, looking at kind of revivals of perhaps these industrial spaces take, um, that have been taken over by kind of new creative businesses or, or practices. Um, more recently, um, a design concept awkward in our last um, forecast for 22. We look here at the, the quite dramatic changing roles in our society, in, in communities um, particularly, so referencing everything from kind of key workers to those more kind of local heroes as we really assess what's, what's most important or who's most important in, um, in global crisis, crises. Um, so then also next season, um, we are looking, and this is what we're working on at the moment for the next uh, forecast, the next issue of the magazine. We're looking more specifically at historical communities. So those kind of tight to knit, self-sufficient, co-living, kind of almost like bubble-like models that we, we hear about today. Um, and it actually sounds quite appealing. Um, that of more kind of remote sort of island living or even coastal communities in particular which brings me rather neatly to introducing our first um, speaker of the day, Alice Smith um, from the textile design course. So I'm gonna hand over to Alice um, now. Okay, thank Hi. you, Alice. Um, yeah, thank you, Colour High, for letting me do this talk today. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Alice and I've just um, graduated from um, BA Textile Design, especially specialising in print. And my um, final major project is called Coastal Communities, a Narrative of Place. So I basically wanted to focus on this. Um, oh, hang on. Oh, it's not. Uh, Try and click the screen, Alice, maybe. Ah, here we are. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to focus on this community because I'm from Wales. so. I was brought up in this little coastal town in Wales. Um, yeah, and I just sort of wanted to sort of document the coastal livelihoods, um, in particular, the fishing industry. Um, so I sort of took pictures of the fishermen at work. Um, I looked into this sort of film, archive film called The Milford Fisherman, which was uh, basically about in the 70s, these um, fishermen who go off to sea. Um, and it's quite an interesting sort of um, livelihood. It's very sort of, yeah, um, hard. And yeah, so I was kind of looking at sort of um, the industry and how it's declining. Um, it's a really tough life, um, livelihood and lifestyle. Um, so yeah, I was just really interested in documenting their lives. Um, yeah, so this is sort of my um, visual kind of, narrative so I was kind of collecting images from like the fishing nets um collecting the sort of images on the plastics um the colors coming through of the blues and the greens and then sort of contrasting that with the sort of natural harbor landscape with the mud and stuff um taking pictures of like fishermen at work so taking pictures of their hands and their gloves um yeah so that was sort of my visual inspiration um this slide is sort of about my idea of bringing sort of traditional techniques and looking at the community and how I could bring um, skills and create workshops from these. So I was looking at sort of knots, like um, nautical knots um, and doing step-by-step -step ways of how to do these knots. I used to like um, go sailing when I was a kid and we had to learn like figure of eight knots and bowline knots. So I thought it was an interesting sort of community technique that could be used 
Um, and it also links to his history. So a lot of the um, fishermen, when they used to like um, break the nets, they'd have to remend them and stuff. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of a very valuable skill that would link to the community in place. Um, yeah. Um, this is sort of my materiality narrative coming through where I was sort of looking at um, upcycling outdoor waste. Um, I looked at a local sail repairs shop and they were they donated loads of old sails to me and spinnakers. So I thought it'd be quite interesting to work with that as a material. Um, and then I thought this could be a material that I could use in terms of using this as a, for my community workshops. Um, so I was thinking of ways of how I could use it and obviously bringing in the knotting and the print together that sort of formed sort of the idea of some of my workshops that I would design for families. Um, this was an interesting book that I sort of read up on and sort of taught me the principles of community and design and how it can come together. Um, I quite like the quote, um, materials and making are tools and processes that can bring people together. So I was thinking of um, bringing families um, together and then sort of using my own textile knowledge and principles of making and bringing that to maybe design some well future workshops yeah um, this is a designer Bethany Williams who I was really inspired by who kind of looks at how she uses the communities um, and shares skills in her own practice and uses the community and yeah it becomes a sort of like cycle of exchange and a more sustainable way of designing. Um, this was one of my workshops that I proposed. Um, I had my one of my family members take part <laughs> in it, my little sister. Um, so she was sort of my experiment and I would just set out these little workshops and we do it together over um, lockdown. And yeah, so we were basically using the sailcloth and printing onto it using techniques such as mono printing. Um, and then we sort of, the idea was that we'd cut them up, cut them in, into different shapes. And then we'd sort of use interesting basic principles of how to connect the material together. So we'd um, knot it together. We connect it through stripping bits of the sails up and sort of, yeah, it became sort of this interesting process that reflected back into my own work. Um, yeah, so this was another workshop I did with her. Um, I basically gave her the material and there was no really sort of straight outcome, end outcome. It was more of a sort of just give her the materials and see what she can do with them. And we sort of, yeah, that's how it was based. So these workshops would be designed for families um, in the actual community at local area. And it would be, I, well, lots of materials in the, in the location um, where children could just go play with them and see what would happen. And this is my own, um, own end final work. So this is the graduate collection I made and it's kind of meant to sort of reflect some of the workshops I did um, and then feed it back into my own work. So I was looking at how print and um, techniques of the knotting and the roping could come, um, come will yeah, be combined together. So yeah, yeah, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Pass you on to the next person. Uh, is that okay? Be QP next. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Hello. So I'm QP from BA Jury Design. And my graduate collection is about translating human connection into my jury. So, yeah. So this is my mood board. So I craft my um my collection just mostly using the portraits. So the portraits I found in the sec second hand stores and also the markets. 
And also I collect different materials like silver and brass. So they are all recycled materials. And my collection features the spirit of peace and unite, united. So referencing the traditional ceramics repair methods, each piece of my collection, but if each piece of my works um, reforming using the ceramics. So, can I, yeah. So I choose to use blue and white ceramics because they have a long global spine as the long global history and background. So as the ceramics um, import uh, are export from China and they spread to different places of the world. And now every everywhere they got blue and white ceramics. And I think this is a uh, quite important colors and also color com combination of the ceramics industry. So these photos I took in London. So these are markets that have many pottery, ceramics and cups. So I collect different materials and they are mainly blue and white ceramics pottery and these are the cup handles and also these are the broken ceramics plates. So I gathered this material and decide how can I reform them. Sorry. Yeah, okay. So I collect different ceramics from different places and each of them got a trademark as the ceramics that are produced and they will got a trademark. So I think the trademark is represent um, represent the individual like when I group all different parts of the broken ceramics together, linking them together is like putting them together, like linking people from different countries, different story, different story and different background and to show the spirit of United. So this is my final works. So the first, yeah. So this uh, every piece of my works got a name. So this is called "We Are All Nature." So I'm inspired by the flowers, like there's um, different type of flowers, but they are all come from nature. So same as us, we are all from different areas, from different places, got different backgrounds, but then. Actually, we are all in the same world. We are all in a in a same community. So I just group different flower patterns cut from different potteries and then group them together as a piece. And then this is a series of earrings. So the next piece is the bushes. Can you see that? The bushes. Yeah. So it's a series of bushes. So it called genderless. Uh, genderless. So genderless means um we can't um like we have different genders but then it cannot um we can't control our genders so like 
we are all in the same community, so we can't judge each other by our gender. So I make this piece. So, and then the next one is called Uh, very interesting, QP. Thank you for uh, kind of looking Thank through you. it. Maybe we can look at the last slide. Yes. Do, do you want me to pick up? Yes, because. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, QP. Thank you. So, hi, everyone. And I'm Francesca, and I graduated from BA Textiles, specializing in woven textiles. And I'm going to talk through my project, which is uh, woven plain tools. Um, so moving to the next slide. Okay. So Woven Plain Tools is a series of handwoven pieces which try to embody the natural responses and actions um, of the children that I've been working with throughout my project. So it really started with my dissertation writing um, about a year ago, um, in which I was trying to explore. Um, the use of textiles and its potential in early education. And in order to do that, um, I've been collaborating with a London-based nursery that is very much inspired in its methodology by the Reggio Emilia approach. And for those who don't know about the Reggio Emilia approach, it's a very um, community-based um, educational method that has been developed after the Second World War. Uh, in the center of Italy and um, by putting together lots of different um, philosophies and educational methods uh, such as Montessori, um, Piaget, Froebe, lots of different ones. Um, but at the core of it, there is the, um, the idea that each child is unique and therefore each of them needs a lot of different medias in order to express themselves fully. So this was my my main idea while trying textile techniques um, with these children. And also another thing that I really explored is this idea of the dialogue between adults and children, uh, always between in this, um, in this methodology, because um, there needs to be a balance between what children learn from adults and what adults can learn from children in order to improve this educational process. So here you can say I've been um, developing some samples uh, with the use of uh, textile materials and the overhead projector using light and shadow as another media to improve creativity and also like the sensory responses. Um, here as well, we've been uh, working with felt making, which is also another um, strong um, materials to be working with. It has a very strong sensory side and tactile and there's nothing better for children to explore the materials and uh, the weight changes with their own hands. So it's something that they really enjoyed doing. Um, also working with water is something that they really like. Um, so while I was researching on this, I also um, came across the idea of sensory integration disorder, which is um, a problem that children might have when they can't process um, all the sensory inputs that they have and therefore they become either oversensitive or undersensitive to the, to the inputs. So I found out that actually like your use of brushes, it's a method that it's widely used in order to 
um, make them more aware of the surfaces and uh, the contact that they can have um, with the external uh, materials. So really what I was interested in uh, in my project was the natural responses that they had towards materials. So during my workshops, I really let them the freedom to interact with the materials without uh, having too much um, too much of an input really looking at the way they would um, interact with them and the way they would put them in relation to their body in order to explore themselves and their actions um, as well as the external world. So through that I've been developing my own research looking at which possible structures and materials I could use uh, in order to translate these reactions into my own work. And I've always been interested in uh, um, making woven pieces that were not necessarily um, the common idea of cloth that we might have. So really looking at layers and 3D structures and working on that. So the inspiration that I gathered from children responses really gave me the chance to explore that um, fully. So here, for example, are some of the pieces I've been hand weaving that try to like embody this sort of like actions and also the material contrast that they would work with. So for example, looking at shiny and matte, hard and soft, um, warm and cold. So all this sort of like contrast that they might come across uh, um, with the materials that they find in any everyday life. So really looking at layers and I've been using only natural materials because I was actually quite shocked by the amount of um, of plastic and unnatural materials that there is in the toy world. So I was really trying to go against it uh, with my own work. Um, yeah, and really looking at everyday actions that they might interest them. So like, for example, bagging things out, turning things inside out, um, this. So then unfortunately during March, like the lockdown happened. And so I didn't have the chance to uh, finish my project with the nursery because my university um, closed and as well as the nursery. So I didn't have the chance to test my pieces with them. And as I went back home, the first person that I tested my pieces with was actually my grandmother um, that is 97 years old. So I thought she would have been more of a child than probably any other person that I had around. Um, and it was actually really interesting to see the contrast between her and like the way she wanted to explore um, the material as well and the way she would like enjoy touching them as well. And that led me to think about like many more ideas that I can um, use in my own work in order to um, inc include other interactive features. So for example, if they could be connected with each other or they can use um, lights um, as a tool to express of expression or for example, to, to create something completely new. And then in the end, I did find some children to test um, my pieces with. So here, for example, are some um, finger covers that I hand wove with like basketry techniques during the lockdown. And each of them uses um, different materials that create a sort of um, a change in perspection when you, in perception, use them um, on their own hands. So it was quite interesting actually to see like how the way they would interact with them. And also I think the most interesting thing was that like no matter like what you want to create and what you will think in your mind, but children will always like make something different um, um, from what you thought. And that's, I think, the most interesting thing. And I think the core of my project were really, really was this sort of like dialogue between me and them that went sort of like back and forward and was really balanced because um, I learned a lot from them as well as they um, learned from me and enjoyed the activities that I offered to them. So I really... It's something that I really uh, aim to, um, to continue in my own practice as well. Um, then I'll pass on to Sam, I think. Hello. Right. Hi, everybody. I'm Samantha Mensa. Um, I've graduated from textile design, also specializing in print. Um, and my project is identity. So this is just a mood board of what I started off with. It's a collection of images um, 
that inspired me on my project and a color palette here of where I decided to move on with. Um, my project looks closely at three main cultures that surround me. So that is the Jamaican culture, the, the Ghanaian culture and the Filipino culture. Um, these are the three main cultures that I grew up and are still kind of around um, now and influence my life quite a lot. So in these three um, cultures, I wanted to look at um, because I was very intrigued with how similar things were, especially the crossover between the island of Jamaica and um, Ghana and the Philippines and how different they are, but the crossover in the tradition and the culture. And these are some traditional cloths. Um, the first one being from Jamaica, the second one from Ghana, um, from the Philippines, and the third one from um, Ghana. The second and the third are both woven fabrics um, and I saw quite a lot of similarities in that. So I really wanted to delve into that for my research. I also looked at a few photographers because on my process of learning and gathering more information about these cultures, um, one of the things that stood out for me around the topic of identity is the fact of these countries being colonized and the idea of gaining freedom um, for them to create their own identities away from um, the colonies and, and all those things. So that was very um, interesting thing for me. So with those countries, a lot of them were um, gained, well, a lot of them gained freedom towards the 50s, um, the, the late 50s, 60s, 70s. So um, that influenced my work a lot in terms of the photography and making it a bit dated. I wanted to do something a bit, a bit fresh and funky with that. So in the process of all that, um, that research and finding out all these things, um, I decided to collaborate with another friend of mine who's also a photographer, Mary Maselli. Um, and we were just looking at culture and how we can mash up some of the cultures that we, we resonate to. So for me, it was the Ghanaian culture, but also the British culture. We've got the Walker's crisps there. Uh, we all know that they have that in, a, you know, in every meal deal that you can think of. Um, it's just well known, you know, growing up and having it in your lunchbox and things like that. Um, so it's just mashing up those kind of things and having the supermarket, which is also very known from my childhood as something that we drank as kids um, because it's not alcohol, but it looks like alcohol. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. And then I had another um, photo shoot and this one was a bit different. This was based on more so the 60s and the 50s idea, trying to recreate um, these images from some, um, well, from all of the, these garments that I've made myself as well. So it was interesting to, to capture these shapes and also the garments um, and try and recreate that era within that with the model. And then again, uh, as some of, the other um, students have spoken during lockdown, had to be very creative with uh, my process. So I just grabbed my brother um, and told him that he would be my model. Um, and then also using myself as a muse to try and recreate this idea of identity, but also trying to capture the era of the time that I was looking at through that. And then again, just capturing images it was, I think during lockdown, it was quite hard to, to transition because you have to kind of transition your mind from one place to another. So I was just saying to my brothers, just act normal, be you, because this is about identity and I just want to see what you're going to do. So this is kind of like what they did. <laughs> so through the, my process, I was also looking at typography um, and fonts. So I was just playing around with different um, words that people had come up with um, through a questionnaire that I'd sent them about things that they identify with. Um, so as these look like prints, as well as they are prints, they're also um, they're also words that people have have brought up. And then again, just going deeper into typography and font and playing around with that. And then I progressed onto my prints. So just mashing everything together with the colors, the typography, 
and also the photography um, and just seeing what I could come up with and, and trying to make it playful, but also trying to make it quite dated as well, in a sense. And then this is just the, the photography of what I had done and um, after being edited and trying to bring it back to that 50s, 60s look. And then finally, I had um, made a magazine to put all of this because I couldn't, I didn't know what was the best way initially when I started, but I realized that a magazine would be a great way to demonstrate and to put together how people identify with culture and what they identify with um, without having to get rid of anything else. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, I'm Millie um, and I've just graduated from jewelry design. Um, and I'm gonna talk about my, my final collection which is called Jokale. Um, and the name Jokale comes from, um, it's a word that means plaything. Um, and my collection is all about engaging with the pieces um, that I've created through play in order to create your own piece of jewelry. Um, so I've made um, a selection of pieces that all come together in a variety of ways so that the wearer has, has an ownership over that piece rather than it just being my piece that they're wearing. Um, and this, the initial research for my collection came from the idea that we box ourselves as either a creative or a non-creative quite often. Um, and I'm a strong believer that we're all creative and creativity isn't something that you either have or you don't have. I think we all have it and we have to practice it and you have to um, keep practicing it in order to like expand your creativity. Um, and I found myself over the last few years that creativity is really important for my well-being. Um, and I think a lot of people have found that over the last few months during lockdown. Um, and so I wrote my dissertation about the importance of creativity for well-being, which led to my strong desire to make pieces that would encourage creativity from people who might not um, generally, like typically engage with a creative activity. Um, which is why I think jewellery is a great place for this to happen because a lot of people engage with jewellery um, whether they see themselves as creative or not. Um, they might not be the type of person who you know would go to a life drawing class or paint um, but they, they will engage with jewellery even though they'd say that they're the least creative person ever. Um, and so it's a great place because it's comfortable for them, they understand the jewellery, they know what jewellery is supposed to be um, and with the collection, what was really important for me was that there was, there's no wrong answer. So you, you put the pieces together in any way that you like. Um, and there's no way that it can, it can go wrong. Um, because I think that's a, a big barrier for people um, in engaging with creativity. I think often people are scared that it's going to go wrong or they're going to do it badly. Um, but because the collection is is pre-made pieces, they can't they can't go wrong. Um, and I think people often find it easier to observe creativity than to engage in it. Um, and they sort of sit on the outside of the creative community, um, and they maybe are a bit tentative to to delve further or deeper into it um, and actually take part in a more creative activity. Um, so, as with everyone else, I asked my family members during lockdown to create pieces um, that they could wear with the, with the pieces that I'd created. Um, and it was really amazing to see the different, the different ways that people, that my family put things together and they did things that I hadn't even explored during the making of the, um, of the project, um, which really showed me sort of the strength in numbers and the strength in different perspectives and how you need 
you need to see other people's ways of looking at things in order to fully understand things yourself and to see the true possibilities that lie within those objects because we all started from the same same however many objects but we all came up with such different um, final outcomes so I've just got a few examples of the pieces um, that that were created by my family and um, household um, and you can see throughout that people have used the same pieces but for different different things so these are um, wooden wooden blocks on a chain toggle in this one um, and then in the next one the wooden blocks then put onto a necklace but then it's also been worn as a ring um, and then you can see the more wooden blocks on the rope necklace and then these toggle pieces on the left um, which can come together in different ways and can be worn as rings as well um, and then throughout the collection some pieces can be worn on their own so the 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 rings and things can be worn on their own so it's not too much I'm try I tried not to push people out of their comfort zone too much so there are things that jump out as jewelry and you think okay yeah I can see how you can wear that um, but then this ring on the right the stone isn't attached to the band so if you see the stone on its own um, you might not quite understand why it's how it can be worn as jewelry um, so just to try and push people a little bit to have to think um, slightly outside of their, outside of what they would imagine to be jewellery. Um, so yeah, here's just some more examples of the pieces. Um, and I think, for me, I think community is sort of a sh something that is shared. Um, and in making these pieces, we all shared the experience of making making something different from the same from the same body of work um, and sort of could, once you understood the body of work, you could comment on other people's and feed into each other's ideas, which was really nice to do. Um, so yeah, that's my collection. Sorry, I'm just requesting control. Has that worked? Oh, there we go. Lovely stuff. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Emily. Um, I've just graduated from Material Futures, um, the master's course at CSM. And for my graduate project, I've spent the last year delving into the really complex, really contradictory food system, looking at how it works and how we interact with it. Um, and this is my project, and it's called Hunger for Change. And so I kind of wanted to start with like a little bit of background information, because there's quite a lot. I mean, there's quite a lot that I've been looking at. And so looking at the food industry as one of the most valuable in the world and this economic power it has that has led it to become one of the least transparent or sustainable. And so this food system, and so that's the growing, the harvesting, the shipping, the distributing, the selling, everything that's involved with getting food from the ground to our plate accounts for nearly a third of all global greenhouse gas emissions. And at the same time, an estimated third of all food produced globally is wasted. While still in 2020, millions of people are hungry. So this is the inside of a Peckham food bank. I live in Peckham and I base my whole project around here. And it's one of over a thousand food banks supported by the Trussell Trust, which is the biggest um, food bank charity in the UK. And it's where I spent a lot of time in the last year helping the team there make up food parcels. At the moment, I mean, before the lockdown, a record number of people were relying on emergency food parcels from food banks in the UK specifically. And as this global pandemic continues, we're experiencing unprecedented levels of food insecurity and poverty. So a quick note about how food banks work, because lots of people don't understand or have never visited one. Um, to use a food bank, you have to be referred. So you have to be given a voucher from either, it's usually a higher power, like a social worker, a nurse, a GP, one of these kind of um, people, and they give you a voucher, which you exchange for three days worth of non-perishable food. This um, food, you get this parcel. There's a picture actually of, there we go. This is all the parcels we were boxing up for different size families for different kind of dietary requirements. But the thing is that you can only claim six emergency food parcels per year. That's only 18 days worth of food out of 365 that you can actually claim. 
So what do we do with all these like huge complex problems and what can I do coming at it from like a design background? You know, is there a solution? Um, honestly, no, not really. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time this year trying to work out what could be done. Um, but I did kind of start noticing that food provides this really unique opportunity because it is so universal, like everyone eats. And so everyone can help motivate change and make decisions that help things. And so I began this project with a huge amount of research, largely in the form of volunteering with food-based NGOs, nonprofits, charities, and these are just some images of some of the different kind of activities and group classes and cookery courses. And um, one of them is called Food Cycle, which is all about re kind of directing, redistributing surplus waste food. And working with these people made me really appreciate just how much food is a social fuel as well as like a physical fuel. And as humans, we're like innately social animals and we've evolved to unite around food to better thrive. And so it's a vital communication tool. You know, you feed to protect, you share food to show your love. As like a feeder and a host, all I want to do is feed people. And so I began hosting my own events um, in my local community. So these are my soupy Sundays, which I kind of started setting up. This is all pre-lockdown. Um, to kind of start a conversation about food insecurity and poverty. And this gave me such valuable insight into why people in the area I live in, in Peckham in South London, you know what their personal experiences are to do with hunger some of a lot of people had never experienced hunger and didn't understand quite how close it is you know our neighbors and people around me not everyone is quite as secure as luckily that a lot of us are and just kind of working out different relationships with food and these conversations that i had with many people really became like the most important valuable bit of my research um and so from this, I made my first community larder. This one's called the Help Yourself Shell. And I put it up at the end of my road to see what happened. And after a very um, unusual morning where I had a run in with the police and some very strange conversations with the council who had no idea what I was doing, I left this simple, it's just a cupboard. It's nothing fancy. It's unrefrigerated, but it's open all the time. You don't have to sign in food. You don't have to explain why you're taking or what you're taking. And basically the idea is that people can donate what they can and take what they need and that's it. And I observed it for a week and kept track of what was going in and out and spoke to the people who were using it and why they were using it and spoke to the people who had problems with it, because some people did and just kind of worked out what was going on. And then I began to plan for more. And I was in conversation with lots of different councils and trying to work out how we could get one of these at the end of every street. Um, and then lockdown happened. And suddenly food became the most talked about, worried about and for those who could afford it, hoarded thing. And suddenly my project was so much more relevant and then so much scarier because suddenly it was relevant. Um, and so I kind of had to rethink how we're gonna do this because there's so much worry about food at the moment, but it is so important. So maybe this is a great opportunity to kind of really use this momentum about it. And so one of the first things that I tried in lockdown was this project called the Doorstep Food Bank Project, which I kind of started on social media platforms. And the idea being that everyone could make their own mini community larder or doorstep food bank in lockdown out of whatever they had to hand. So I made this first one, the really rainbowy one on the left, um, and then kind of posted it and kind of spread the word. And then I got an amazing response. And these are some of the food banks that people started making in and around my community and all over the place, you know. And the idea that anyone could donate what they could from their own cupboards and then put it out very locally to them on their front wall or on their front doorstep to help their communities and help their neighborhoods. I think it's such a simple, easy idea that people really got on board. I also think I really helped with the whole lockdown boredom thing. So that was great, a little craft project for lots of people who were just sat at home. Um, but yeah, so kind of while this was happening, while the kind of doorstep food bank thing was going on, I had to move my original cupboard and so, oh, what have I done? There we go. Um, the Help Yourself Shelf moved to the, um, it's called Copperson Community Centre. Um, it's the church around the corner from me. And they had this community centre and they were really excited to kind of host this. And it's still there now. It's in constant use. There's like an ebb and flow of food going in and out of it, which is great. And then I kind of thought during lockdown, I'll start making some others. And so I made this one. This is my house. This is the front of my house. Um, and I made this quite small, very open one because I was so limited with tools and materials about how to make it. And I put that one outside. And then I started noticing that, so this one, this is Gab's. She saw mine and made her own. 
in Camberwell. So this is her community larder. And so, you know, this idea of like spreading this idea, you can design it how you want, it can be whatever you like. But if you can help one of your neighbors get food when maybe they couldn't, that's something really powerful and really exciting. And then this is my most recent one. Um, and this was a collaboration with the McDermott Community Garden, which is a community garden, um, again, in Peckham. And I built this one more in line with the aesthetics of the community garden and with help from everyone who worked there and volunteered for this garden. And that one is still very much in use. Um, and yeah, so this is my project to date. I'm currently working on more. I've also made a manual that kind of helps anyone if they want to build their own, because I want this to be an open thing and it's not a difficult, complicated thing, but the manual just has like safety, food, health and safety tips, all of which I've learned in various degrees of success throughout this project. If anyone would like it, please get in touch. Um, I'm hoping to get it printed very soon at the moment, it's just digital. Um, but I think the success of this could be if everyone kind of joined in and made their own and every community had this kind of free, accessible, open source of shared food to ultimately ensure that everyone has enough to eat um, so that we can kind of take ownership of food security in our neighborhoods, reduce food waste and help unite kind of disparate communities. And that's everything from me. And there's, this is a really nice quote, I'll just say if you like, um, and it's all about environmental act activism and how food activism, because it is the most personal, it's the most thing that individually you can impact and how you can really make a difference by choosing how and what you eat. Um, yes, thank you. Fantastic. Great. Okay. Well, thank thank you to all all the, all the presenters. There were some really super diverse projects that all touched on issues of community in various different ways. Um, we are kind of up against it with time, so I think we'll head out to some questions fairly quickly. Um, and I think Hannah was going to kick off with a with a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just as a bit of a kind of just to round everything up. Thank you, everyone. Such fascinating projects. Um, and all touched on community in such kind of from different angles. So I'm just gonna kind of throw it out there. Um, what what does community mean to you? Anyone can answer um, just to get, get things rolling. Anyone? Well, maybe we better pick someone. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, what about Sam? Sam? Sam, what do you reckon? Um, what, what, what do you mean? I mean, it can be a couple of words, a couple of words. Um, I think I think for me personally, community is um, it's just caring, like caring about one another, like caring about someone else's well-being and making that um, a consistent thing. And whatever consistency means to you in terms of like, it doesn't have to be every day because you know sometimes <laughs> you can't do that. But um, yeah, and I think that's that's what's also like very much involved in my work and just how community looks so different. So I have, you know, friends and family that are Filipino, that are Jamaican, that are, you know, German, and it's just a very wide spectrum, but the, the common thread between that is love and care. So I think for me, um, yeah, that's a big thing. And love and care comes in so many different like sizes. It comes in food, it comes in gifts, it, can, it comes in quality time, so yeah. yeah. I think that's yeah, that's a really great response. Really, yeah, yeah. Also loved um, Millie's comment about community mm -hmm. is something that's shared, and I think a lot of the projects touch on that in some way. That that feeling of kind of, you know, I, whether it's shared ideas, shared identities, shared, um, you know, heritage. Um, so I think you know that that phrase came out had to, had great resonance with me. So I thought that was really great. Yeah. Um, does anybody else want to, you know, just, you know, in a couple of words, because I think it's kind of quite nice just just keeping it quite free. You know, what does what does community mean to somebody else? I think for me, it's a lot to do with communication and just having these discussions and these conversations, because everyone has a really unique and very interesting point of view or history or story behind it. And I think the more you can kind of talk about things and understand where people are coming from and why I think you get a much more rounded view of lots of different kind of issues you know subjects topics all this kind of stuff and I think that's really valuable to me and I think that's how you can kind of create more united communities really yeah, yeah. well Emily you, you said you know your conversations that you had with people with were your best research um, and I thought yeah I thought that was really 
Yeah, though definitely, definitely the most interesting, the most valuable. Yeah, I mean, there were some really interesting examples, I think, in, in how people had used um, materials and, and processes to kind of define the concept of community. And I don't know whether Alice um, or QP you would like to touch on perhaps the, ma the material aspect, maybe QP in terms of the, the yeah. processes you chose, because I, I think we you you're yeah. a little cut short. So maybe there were some really interesting processes there that were kind of a metaphor for mm -hmm. things coming together. Um, at first, when I choose the topic of my graduate collection, I'm I'm just walking by the market, and then I quite like the communication, like when people communicate uh, in the market, like they buy something that people used before, and then it's like um exchange about their cultures. So I really like the concept of the market, and also it's about the spirit of unity. So I choose to use United to be my concept. So I just want to collect different materials. At first, I collect different materials like the antique box, different material. But then, and after that, I concentrate on ceramics, teapots, ceramics, and also pottery because I think that um, ceramics is quite related to our daily life. And then blue and white color is represent the spirit of peace and also unity. So I choose the materials like blue and white ceramics. Mm -hmm. And also when I process my materials and I use um, my just my own hands to cut it because I think that sustainability is quite important for me too. Like I don't want to maybe use the machine or use, um, find other factory to help me to cut the pottery. So I just cut it by my hands. And then like, I want the pattern, so I cut it and then to reform it and then um, to make a collection of my jewelry. Fantastic, yeah, I love the idea of kind of global local communities and how yeah. pattern can actually un unite, um, you know, to create, create a unified yeah. identity. So yeah. I thought that was really interesting and color. Yeah, because yeah, because all the poetry, the patent is related to human and also the nature. So I think it's quite suitable for uh, for me to use it as a material. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Well, can we ask that same question to, to Alice for, from your perspective, if that's OK? Um, yeah, I think my materials, um, they all came from the same location where I was researching. Yeah. Um, so I think all the sail cloth, it came from like a little local sail makers. So it, it linked directly to the community. Um, and I sort of designed workshops based around purely that one material. And I think with the workshops, the processes that I did kind of gave me um, ideas and for my own work. So it was kind of like a sort of mm -hmm. an exchange, a cycle really. Mm -hmm. kept kind of going back to the workshop and back to my own work. So it sort of, it was really good in that way, yeah. I love I love the way you were linking to the heritage skills and that sort of feeling of um, I identity and community through very traditional skills. I thought that was that was really yeah, interesting. And, like learning how to do knots. I think yeah, that was a really important part of the project and a technique that I could be accessible to everybody, um, parents, children, whatever. So yeah, it was a it would be a good sort of social group to, um, workshop to do. Yeah, yeah. multi-generational as well. I love how you ask so many different people to, to work on it. And say, same with you, Millie. There's so many connections as well, which is important. Um, maybe, maybe Francesca, do you want to touch on a little bit about your, how you're through your research side of things? How, you know, your, you know, what your research threw up in terms of community and, because I kind of quite like the fact it was what you said about it being very open-ended and kind of not knowing what your outcomes were going to be and, and whether you felt that was a, you know, a strength and, and really how that, how that worked. Yeah, I mean, I think that was really the starting point of my project, even though at the beginning I wasn't completely sure on what I was going to make. But um, because the approach um, that was um, uh, the one uh, that the nursery would use, that is very community based. So therefore, um, there's a real dialogue between uh, adults and children. And there is this real like need to take children seriously and their responses seriously in order to learn from that. So I think that was 
really um, the core of my of my process in terms of like what I would use from it. Uh, I would take every, I would document any single thing um, very seriously. And uh, I would just be very open to use any of that uh, within my work. And that was, I think, um, what allowed me to be very experimental and very um, open with my work as well. Because I would let them be very open, I, but I would also let myself to be very open within my own work. Yeah, and I, and I, I think, you know, maybe that's one of the, the great possibilities of, of community engagement projects that actually you, you have, it's an exchange of ideas. I'm not necessarily sure what you're going to, to get back and that can actually trigger all sorts of unexpected outcomes, which I think we've seen through a lot of the projects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and definitely with lockdown getting in the way, it sounds like you've, you know, some of you were, were doing projects that actually felt quite relevant with almost without you knowing. And then they kind of, Emily, for example, yours becoming kind of couldn't be more relevant. Um, and Francesca, you, you know, going, um, you know, and sharing the project with your grandmother, which perhaps you didn't, you wouldn't have done um, otherwise. So they actually took some really nice turns. Um, what about talking a little bit about well, well-being in community? Because I thought that yeah. was a really interesting kind of yeah. additional angle that, that came out from from perhaps Millie's project. You yeah. Want to talk a little well, bit about, I thought that was really interesting, a little bit more about, you know, how almost like stepping outside um, the creative community and actually how that can in, in, in some ways be quite an alien experience. And actually, I, lo I loved what you were doing there. Um, I don't know whether you want to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think I just, I found for myself that creativity is so important for my well-being. But I think also it can be such a daunting thing to take part in if you're not, if you're not like used to it. Um, and I think we often get very out of practice in our later life and like growing up. A lot of my friends from school sort of like, I used to do art with them and now they, they're like, oh, I wish I was creative. I never do anything. Um, and it's like, well, you do, there's so many different ways that creativity comes through. Mm. Um, and I just think that if people sort of let go of that fear of, of making something wrong or not doing something that was good enough, then they could relax into it and actually really gain something from it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. could, could you imagine doing other, other projects through jewellery where the com community and other people are kind of involved? How might you take this project further, do you think? Yeah, I think it could be interesting, like with the, the ways that people use the pieces in ways that I hadn't expected. So I think it could continuously grow with um, sort of changing the pieces after seeing what people are inclined to do, because everyone has a very different instinct of how to work with the pieces. Um, and I sort of, I didn't really realise that at the beginning of the project. It, I had to get people to engage with it in order to learn about how how everyone has such a different perspective on it and yeah and their instinct like we very much go with our instincts um and it's interesting when when because i've come from such a jewelry background i sort of knew what the things were supposed to do mm -hmm. so i i sort of sectioned them but but people who didn't so much like my sister's a science teacher so she would just put anything with anything and it was yeah sometimes much more interesting results yeah, ways of getting interesting outcomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, perspective. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe one last question. I don't know how you know whether we should be quite tight on time. One last question, perhaps. I mean, maybe, maybe Emily. You know, what was the feedback from the community? Maybe, you know, was that say, largely very positive? Yeah. Um, you know, so I've got three cupboards at the moment that are all in use now. And there, there's like a constant ebb and flow of food going in and out, which is just so great to see. And the one up at the uh, community centre is now being used also by um, lots of restaurants in the area. And they're just putting their surplus in there, which is great. Amazing. But there has been, I mean, there's been vandalism. There's been, I mean, the first time I put the, you know, one of my neighbours rang the police on me because they thought I was, I don't know, fly tipping. I don't know what the problem was. <laughs> but yeah, so there's been kind of a mixed... Um, mixed reaction I'd say on the whole but I think that makes it so much more interesting to be honest mm -hmm. because these are like live real things you know these aren't in a gallery setting that everyone who's going is like-minded and agrees with everything it's quite interesting working in that environment because you have to think on your feet so much more and you just have to go for it and try it yeah. and like you know 
uh, you know, say sorry later rather than asking for permission to do something is always the best way to do it because then you kind of see what happens. Um, so I think generally really positive, um, which is why I think I've got some more in the kind of pipelines at the moment. I think the whole kind of COVID thing, people were just a bit nervous around a lot of what I was trying to do in sharing food, um, which has been quite a kind of obstacle to try and get over. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, it's been good. It's been really good. I, I, lo I loved the, you know, the idea of the kind of the open source manual for other people to do the same. I think that's kind of a really nice way of kind of, you know, allow enabling other people to to kind of yeah. draw on the skills that you have um, to, to take the idea further and make it even bigger. So I think that's that was great. Yeah, yeah sharing your research and knowledge. <laughs> Sorry, I just said, share, you know, sharing your research and your knowledge is, you know, it's so it's so valuable. Mm. Thank you for that. Anyone wants one, just let me know. I can send it. <laughs> I'll have one. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. yeah, definitely. We'll start up little pilots all over the place. <laughs> it sounds great. I think on, on that note, maybe we'll wrap everything up because time is slowly running out. Um, Hannah and Rebecca, is that okay with you? Or? That's perfect. Yes. Yeah. We could go on forever. Yeah, we, I was just. I, I mean, we could go on but um i yeah. just yeah just a couple of i mean observations i mean i have to say i think really inspiring um to see all your projects together across the different disciplines and you even brought some ceramics in from qp and and lots of other um kind of disciplines coming in and crossing over and looking at you all together um you are you know we are community in itself so it's it's lovely to see Millie in the back in the college and QB in Hong Kong and everybody in, in different places um, of the world, but we're still connecting. And I think the, the generosity that you as designers have developed has, has blown me away quite a lot because you've been so open and, and really kind of receptive to create that dialogue um, and to inform your materials, your processes and your outcomes through that. And I think that that will be really interesting to see how Hannah We'll translate that in the next magazine um, and make that into a feature and, and, and actually see how that um, generates other responses from the industry and, and really bringing the community in with everything you do and, and continuing the dialogue, especially at a time like now, we're really depending on working together more than ever. Um, we can't really go forward just in our own little bubbles. We have to connect on all these different levels. And I think that's been super inspiring and super encouraging as well to see how much is possible um, uh, as a designer to actually inform all these different communities in, in positive ways and, and, and create new connections for all of us. So thank you all for participating and hopefully we'll do some more series in, in this kind of format. I think it's been really inspiring and, and really enlightening to um, yeah, connect, reconnect and um, yeah, engage with all of you. Um, and yeah, creating future, future communities online but also offline and hopefully back in college soon as well. Brilliant. All right, thank you very much and you. see you soon, hopefully, all of you. Brilliant. Thank <laughs> you, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.